All right. Welcome, listeners. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Unsecurity Podcast. This is episode 132. And the date is May 18th, 2021. Joining me is my good friend uh, and, you know, my buddy, uh, Brad Dye. Brad, how you doing? Good. How are you? Good. So we were just talking before the show started how uh, you're tired. You're getting your second shot Moderna tomorrow. Yep, I'm excited to be able to like, you know, function normally. It was, I'll be honest, we had uh, my daughters play soccer. And we had our, the, they had their first game on Saturday. And it was weird being outside around people and not wearing a mask. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. So here in Minnesota, you know, for our listeners, the uh, our governor, Governor Walls, uh, rescinded the mask mandate, I think, last week, right? Yep. Yeah. For fully vaccinated people or when you can safely put it, socially distance. So, I mean, being outside of the soccer field is pretty easy to yeah. stay, be away from each other. Yeah. And I think it's been maybe three weeks since or two weeks, at least three weeks, maybe since I had my second shot. I did the Pfizer. Yeah, my wife had hers and her second shot in like in February, the benefits yeah. of being a nurse, but she went into the store without a mask and was like, came back out. She was just picking up some, some food after the game. And she was like, that was so weird. Right? <laughs> yeah, it totally is. No, because I've been going to stores too, you know, out here without a mask. And uh, yeah, it's weird, man, because you can see people's faces now. I don't like it. People can I see like my it. Face. Oh, yeah, I don't like you seeing mine, but yeah. I like seeing yours, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, there's been a lot of things happening in the last, uh, you know, weeks. It seems like the world moves, you know, it's spinning faster than, what is it, the 23 hours, 54 minutes? Is that how long it takes for the world to spin? Something like that? Yeah. Seems like it's going faster than that. Uh, in the last, what, one, two, three, four, four episodes, we've had Roger Grimes. Mm -hmm. episode 128 which i thought was just awesome unfortunately we had recording issues but you know i'm blaming all that on roger we'll just have to have them on again yeah and then uh the week after that we had rod ron warner which yeah. is you know just another awesome dude and we had john strand and then last week we had chris roberts and i've gotten a ton of really good feedback about all those podcasts yeah uh, this week we were scheduled to have Gabe Friedlander, but then he went on vacation. Why? What's up with that? Yeah, it's like security goes away. Uh, but anyway, took a vacation, so we'll have him on, I think, uh, next episode. But this is a good opportunity for you and I to talk about a couple of things. You know, one thing I want to talk about, uh, there's plenty we could talk about. <laughs> Just a few but, things. Yeah. But last week, uh, President Obiden, or President Obiden, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, President Biden, his name is Joe Biden, uh, issued a, an executive order. It's Executive Order 14028, and it's labeled Improving the Nation's Cybersecurity. Uh, so we did an analysis of that, you know, a pretty in-depth analysis where, you know, read every single word. I actually have a document where I took every date that was mentioned in that executive order uh, and, and started sorting it by that. Wow. Uh, yeah, and then he calls out, you know, specific, you know, for instance, you know, within 90 days of receipt of the recommendations described in, you know, subsection B of this section, the FAR Council shall blah, blah. So then I did another passed through where I took, you know, you called out the FAR Council and this, or FAR Council in this particular section of the section. Uh, so I also uh, organized it by responsibility. Mm. And then, and then I did it again, where I actually just took a summary and uh, wrote opinions on the executive order. And then share that with you and yep. I think Oscar as well. That'll be published, I think, today. Did you get a chance to read any of this stuff? I, I'll be honest. I have not read what you sent over. 
yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah. It was, today, I, I will be able to read it. I actually have some free time. It's weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll post it on the show notes, too, because it will be published. We'll publish it online. Um, it'll be in the show notes. And uh, if you follow Security Studio or FR Secure on social media, you'll you know be able to find it there probably on LinkedIn and what have you. Uh, yeah. But it's a really important executive order. So a lot of people don't realize that an executive order is law. Yeah, it basically is. It's so my takeaway from reading it and kind of reading some of the uh, summaries and what other people are saying, and because it's always good to get multiple points of view. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's basically saying uh, federal government get your shit together. Well, right, but. You know, as you read through the executive order, you know, you have to, I, I view everything with a grain of salt, right? I mean, it's, the government hasn't exactly set good precedent in terms of being trustworthy, uh, be, being consistent, well, I guess consistently untrustworthy, maybe. But, uh, but yeah, they do need to do a lot better job you know, so when you read through the executive order, there are 11 sections mm-hmm. to the order. Uh, the first section is policy. Essentially, you know, what you'd expect in policy, you know, high level, you know, I, I pulled out the policy statement itself, which is, you know, and I quote, It is the policy of my administration that the prevention, detection, assessment, and remediation of cyber incidents is a top priority and essential to national and economic security. Yeah, I, so I was reading, I'm gonna send, the, I'm gonna send you the, there's two, well, what's going on? Uh, hey, what, you're on a podcast. I know, my, my computer just flipped out for a second there. Um, there was an article on uh, Lawfare blog that I thought was pretty good summary of it and basically their takeaway was yeah this picks off the low-hanging fruit it's the basics that the fundamentals that we constantly preach and then yeah. uh, some um, of that but then if you read into it man there's there's some concerning things oh, in there. such as maybe i missed the, or where <laughs> such as uh you know the rush to zero trust architecture oh uh, yeah you know, when I don't think, I think it's premature, you know, zero trust architecture is a nice marketing thing. Uh, there's a lot to be said about zero. The, the concept of zero trust is awesome. The application of zero trust is nearly impossible for a complex organization, especially the government. Yeah. I, yeah, we'll see how that plays out. I kind of, I, I kind of took it as like, hey, we're going to go to the cloud. So as you migrate, take this in, you know, integrate this as there's the migration to the cloud. That's not the way it reads, but could be. I mean, it could be that's what they meant. But they they really approached it as two separate things. There is the zero trust architecture, and then there's the cloud, and even the zero trust architecture. So you know, step one essentially in zero trust architecture is really intimate understanding of what the hell you have right yeah you you know hardware asset inventory software asset inventory applications uh, business processes data flows you know it you gotta be pretty tight yeah so the reason that i said it that way is there's like they, they put out the fact sheet which is their you know the crib notes and you know, it, there's it says executive order helps move the federal government to secure cloud services and a zero trust architecture, multi-factor and whatever. But then uh, the government must lead the way to increase its ad- and increase its adoption of security best practices, including employing a zero trust security model, accelerating movement to cloud secure cloud services. So to me, I, I kind of read that as they're 
they're saying that those two things are are pretty tightly intertwined. They're not. I mean, they're not in. They're not in the actual executive order. You know what I mean? Because in the executive order, it's section three is modernizing federal government cybersecurity and B2 under that is develop a plan to implement zero trust architecture, which shall incorporate as appropriate the migration steps that the National Institute of, Inst of Standards and Technology, so they're referring to SB 800-207, that's all separate. And the next section, which is, or the next subsection is C, it says as agencies continue to use cloud technology, they shall do so in a coordinated deliberate way that allows the federal government to prevent, detect, so on and so forth. And then it says to facilitate this approach, the migration to cloud technology shall adopt zero trust architecture as practicable. So they're separate and then brought together as well. Yeah, I see. That. And I would argue, why would you do zero trust architecture in the cloud and not in well, I think your local infrastructure? It's what we've talked about. It's, I mean, once the cat's out of the bag, as it were, it's almost impossible. So I kind of, that's why I kind of, I, it's like almost a, a, a sound as a practical approach, right? Yeah, we want to go here, but the reality is, it's just not going to happen in existing systems because of how it how it's been done. It's been there for so long. So as you move to new things, you have to incorporate zero trust. Yeah, it'd be nice if that's what it said. <laughs> but well, it's... I mean, but well, it's a government. You can't have it in that plane of language. <laughs> right, but if the executive order is law. You know, you kind of have to go with what it says, right? I mean, yes, you could have written it. So I think what would have been more reasonable than calling out zero trust architecture from the beginning would have been things like, you know, have, have an asset inventory, you know, ha, like uh, have an identity and access management process or system, you know, whatever yeah. that's consistent with whatever as opposed to let's go with the marketing thing of zero trust architecture, call it out specifically by itself, and then also sprinkle it in with other things. Because according to this, you have to have a plan on how you're going to get to zero trust architecture. Like, do it. You know, it's a, that's a good question. I, and I, I don't know. Does it say the dates? Yeah, it says that you have to have a plan but does it have when that will actually be like within x amount of time that you have to be there well within 60 days of the date of this order the head of each agency shall develop a plan to implement zero trust architecture so that's 60 days they have to have their plan to implement zero trust architecture um, but it doesn't say, there's no i think that's probably the the out as it were Right, you have to have a plan, but there's no. I mean, your plan could be ten years long. Yeah, maybe. There's, just, I, I, I don't know. Laws are weird. Laws, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, it would be interesting to see more interpretations of, you know, what specifically, you know, when they need to do because the, the plan has to then be provided they have to provide a report to the director of OMB. Uh, and then the Secretary of Homeland Security in consultation with the Administrator of General Services acting through the Federal Risk and Authorization Management Program. You know, it's like, all right, you know, you kind of have to weave all that. Yeah, well, I think that's the, the challenge is you've got all these things already in place that are law and you can't just like throw them out the window and so you have to you know integrate and work around the existing stuff <laughs> for lack of a better word and you know personally like i've i had a uh, federal court case way back when and 
it went to the Supreme Court over the, the meaning of subparagraph. So, I mean, it's ridiculous how some of this stuff gets, you know, where it is so complex. And gosh, what's the, <laughs> how, how often have we said, what's the enemy of good security? Complexity. And unfortunately, when you're looking at some of this stuff, you can't avoid it, which just means things are confusing and difficult to understand sometimes. Well, that's it, right? Yeah, totally agree. You know, because zero trust architecture conceptually isn't new, regardless oh, of no. you know whoever wants to take credit for you know creating it. They didn't. They created the name. They didn't create the concepts because oh, yeah. you know the de the default deny concepts. You know, defense in depth. You know, network isolation. None of those things are new. They've been around kind of since we oh, started. For, yeah forever so the uh impulse you know in section one then they also or biden also calls out um you know bold changes and significant investments which is good i think that's that's legit we do need to make bold changes we've, we've fallen so far behind that you need to be really bold and you know like you said get your shit together yeah uh, partnering with the private sector obviously is, is very important. And then uh, one statement that kind of like makes the hair rise on the back of my neck a little bit is we must bring to bear the full scope of its authorities and resources. Because every time the, the, you know, the federal government wants to bring to bear the full scope, it's like, oh God, is this going to hurt? <laughs> so we'll see. Yeah, you know, I think, I mean, there's, yeah, I do think overall it was well intentioned and a positive step just because if nothing else, it's getting people to talk about it. And I think that's been a huge struggle that we faced is, you know, the general public just kind of ignores this stuff. And so, well, that, it's pretty hard to ignore this. Well, it is, but you know, I also want to be cognizant. You know, you go into this with eyes wide open. That, you know, are there ulterior motives behind some of these requirements, or are they truly what's best for security? You know, take for instance the movement to the cloud. There's a huge push in this executive order to move to the cloud. Right. They could be good. They could not be good. It kind of depends on you know how you're going to implement. And it's almost like, uh, you know, Linux or Microsoft, what's more secure? You know what I mean? It, it depends on how you use it, right? Right, yeah. So in and of itself, a move to the cloud isn't a security thing, you know, per se. Yeah, I, I kind of, well, yeah, I don't, you know, uh, yeah. I don't necessarily, the cloud, we've, we've always had that. It's just been whose computers are you running the cloud on, right? And so I think when we look at this, it's almost like using the cloud as, or that movement to the cloud is, is the ex excuse or reason, that, you know, hey, well, you gotta go to the cloud, so, as you're doing it, implement zero trust because how do you would you ever get there if you're keeping it all in house? Well, I would, you know, to be honest with you, if everybody else is going to the cloud, I'd rather stay home. I, I'm not. I love, you know I mean? How often? How much? How cyclical is IT too? Right? You saw, right. you know, everything is local. Then you had remote you know, client server with, you know, green screens. And then everyone went to back to workstations that actually processed. And then you had outsourced and now brought it back in and go to the cloud and now come back, you know. So I, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, so, but that's one of the, it's these little tells that make, that, that sort of like 
right? Why the big push to the cloud? Because they're, the big push to the cloud is like really big. And, and actually I'm a little bit ahead of myself too. Let's go back to section two. So section one is policy. Section two is about removing barriers to sharing threat information. That's the title of section two. And really what section two is all about is uh, you know, better sharing, better reporting um, you know, between contracted IT and OT service providers and the federal government. That's good stuff. Um, topics covered in that section, you know, review the existing reporting requirements and procedures, uh, recommend updates to the federal acquisition regulations. So that's far, that's going to affect you, mm -hmm. assume CMMC at some level. Yeah. Or, uh, yeah. And then we have uh, update the FAR itself, uh, enforce IT OT provider compliance. That's probably the crossover. And there's, and CMMC itself isn't called out in the executive order, but FAR and CMMC are like married, well, right? Oh, yeah. No, and DFAR. Yeah. Which is defense acquisition. But, you know, it, I think it's, yeah. I, I like that it is kind of addressing that big issue that we talked about where agencies can't disclose stuff to each other or contract because it's in there. It's like, Hey, no, this is that's BS. Get rid of that. You can't, we got to work together here. Right. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and I think, you know, section two is really favorable, mm -hmm. uh, you know, centralized reporting. And then, you know, at the end of that section, it's, you know, how are we going to pay for it? So there's, you know, a budget provision, uh, well, really, it's, you know, yeah. the OMB, I think, reviews, you know, all this and then, you know, makes a budget accommodation for it. The deadline on that one, the, the entire section, and th this is a little bit concerning, too, is the aggressiveness. You know, I do know, I, you know, you know, I need to move fast, but of all the deadlines in Section 2, the longest one out is October 9th, 2021. So all that stuff has to be completed by then basically six months yeah that's fast well you know i i, I kind of feel like regardless you know it's kind of a damned if you do damned if you don't type of situation where hey we got to go fast well that's too fast well give them three years well gosh the government moves so slow right so uh, I, personally based on what we've seen i'd rather in this case go fast and just be like ripping the band-aid off Right. Well, and you have to call out what, what the, uh, what the risk is in doing that. Right. I mean, there's going to be risks involved no matter which way you go. The risk, I think the primary risk of going that fast Two primary risks that come to mind is one, you won't do it right. Yeah. And the second is it's going to be disruptive. I mean, maybe that's what's needed to get people's attentions and get it taken or you know, right, but that's still risk. Oh, absolutely. You know, and, and when you've got, you know, significant portions or significant, a significant number of resources dedicated to just section two, uh, it takes your eye off the ball of other things that you might be working on as well, right? So, yeah, I assume, well, maybe I shouldn't assume. I was going to say, I assume that people in the federal government aren't just sitting on their hands with nothing to do, but maybe some of them are and you've got, that's another challenge with a lot of this stuff too. When you're moving this fast, somebody has got to do it. So you have to take them from where they're, or, you know, doing something else that hopefully yeah. they're providing value, put them here, or you got to go find them and hire them. And I, I, I hear, you know, the, the rumor is we've got a, <laughs> we've got a shortage of talent. So it's like, all right, something's got to give. Yeah. But I agree. It's got to move fast. We're so far behind. At what point do you just yeah. like, we got to go. Sorry. I, I mean, yeah, I agree. I, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out over the next six months, because there's a, I think there's a lot of, like I said, a lot of good intention. Now, you know, does that translate into good procedures and everything else? And we'll see. Right. Well, so that's section two. And then section three is modernizing federal government cybersecurity. And the main purposes of this 
section, I think really are to force wider adoption of cloud technologies for better or worse. I don't know. I guess if you're moving to the cloud, you know, do it right. But it, it does, you know, beg the question, you know, what specifically moving to the cloud security does for security. Right? There's advantages, but there's also, you know, take the disadvantages and you got to kind of weigh those things. But uh, we'll see. And then uh, zero trust architecture is mentioned in section three, as, as well as multi-factor authentication, which was kind of good to see. Yes. Yeah, I was really happy to see that. Uh, also encrypting data at rest and in transit, centralizing and streamlining uh, access to cybersecurity data and you know investments in technology and personnel to enable all that stuff. All that is in section three. Uh, and that's also super aggressive, man. I mean, oh my gosh, this uh, yeah, the 180 day deadline for all federal civilian executive branch entities to adopt multi-factor. I mean, right? Don't get me wrong, I'm all for getting them on it, but wow, I'm glad I'm not on that project. No, right? And so you've got section two, which is our, you know, which is aggressive, and then you pile on section three. It's like, holy crap, that's a lot to do. Um, and I think, you know, some of the barriers with zero trust architecture, uh, like I said, I'm pro zero trust architecture absent the name. Yeah. So I think the pro name the, is- The theory. Yes, absolutely. 100% behind the theory because it's logical. It makes all the sense in the world. What I don't like is the name and I don't like the way people suggest the, you know, how you implement it, right? Because in order to implement zero trust architecture, vendors are selling more crap, which makes yeah. things more complex, which we, makes it harder to secure. Well, and you're just killing yourself. Well, think of it. I mean, we, we've done that concept. I, I mean, I, I did it to some degree without any of that. Right? It's not, oh, yeah. it's not like you need this stuff. It's, Hey, who has permissions to these folders? Do they need permission? No, get rid of it. Right. Can you log in here? Well, what's your reasoning? No, you don't need you. You don't get it. You, you have to justify yep. the business need before they get access. It's not just oh, everyone thinks open. So, yeah, I, I think all the technology and and things that are being sold, just like you said, make it more complex. It's, at the end of the day, it's really not a hard thing to visualize. Like, right? Hey, nobody gets access until you can prove you need the access. I can do that with it without hundreds of thousands of dollars of technology. Right. Well, and, and there's also the, um, yeah, it's 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 the complexity. It's the adding more stuff into the environment, which makes it more and more difficult to secure. Uh, and you look at the definitions that are provided in our industry about zero trust architecture. So if you look up or Google, what is zero trust architecture? What is zero trust? You'll get the first six or seven things will be all ads. You'll get one okay definition, then you'll get a crowd strike definition. Mm -hmm. If you go to um, NIST SP 800-207, which is kind of the NIST definition, you'll get another definition. If you go to NSA's guidance, you'll get another definition. And it's like, why are we all trying to outsmart ourselves? We always do this. We, we're like, oh, I kept, this is the definition of zero trust architecture. Well, how about just like two words? Make it simple. It's default deny. Right. Well, it's like what I was talking about. <laughs> And then when somebody asks me, well, default tonight to or what? Yes. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's like what I was saying to, with uh, Chris last week, where, you know, it's not necessity, it's laziness. We're, we're going to take something that, you know, takes five minutes to do twice a month and spend eight hours, you know, engineering some script and doing all this stuff because we don't want to have to re remember to doing it twice a month. Right. Like, like it, yeah, it just is, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's frustrating, man, because so, right. So you're going to, you're going to push 
an entire very complex environment, many multi, you know, very complex environments and tell them zero trust architecture. So then they're gonna go, here's the problems. Most people don't know what zero trust architecture even is. Mm -hmm. Even people in our industry, even security people, when you talk to them about zero trust architecture, you get all kinds of different sort of things. It's like asking them what the definition of information security is. <laughs> right? <laughs> but exponentially worse. Yeah. And if you're gonna implement it, you need people. People cost money. Yep. And people are hard to find, especially people who understand zero trust architecture, who aren't from some vendor trying to sell you some crap that actually understand it and will actually implement it properly. Because yeah. here's the thing, if you don't do it properly, you just pissed away a whole bunch of time and money, and you'll have to redo a lot of work that you just spent a lot of time and money on. Yeah, and so, probably it's very going to be disruptive to the business process in the, in the meantime. Oh, 100%, man. Yeah, this is not going to go off like, yeah, you know, everybody was happy. <laughs> no, it's not going to happen that way. People are not going to be happy because you're going to be cutting off access to things that they thought that they needed, but they didn't actually need, that they liked having, but they don't actually need having. It gets, it's not, it's not what it, yeah, okay. Another thing, it adds complexity. So if you look at just, you know, look at NSP or NSP, NIST SP 800-207 look at the things that, that are required for zero trust architecture. You've got policy engine, mm -hmm. policy administrator, policy enforcement points, continuous diagnostics and mitigation system, an industry compliance system, and potentially a whole lot more. Right. And there's a whole bunch of new language there that a lot of people don't never even heard of before. Like policy engine, what the hell's a policy? Yeah. Policy administrator, is that somebody, is that something? Or is it somebody and something? Yeah. You know, policy enforcement points? What the hell is a policy enforcement point? You know what I mean? It's like continuous diagnostics and mitigation system. I mean, these are things that are like, so wouldn't it be better just to take access away from everything and then just? I, yeah. Well, but so here's where, where I struggle is, yeah, in theory, yes, absolutely. But the reality is, right, we talk about it all the time. You have this information security, we have to work with the business, right? We can't be the the no people all the time, can't be, you know, causing constant outages. So, you know, how do you balance trying to transition to that without, you know, significantly negatively impacting the business? Well, that's it too. And when you talk to, you know, I saw a study I think last week or the week before that 55% of C-level executives see information security as a, um, or breaches as being overhyped and essentially they don't care. Wow. That's over half. <sighs> and so then you're going to tell them, Hey, even though, you know, this isn't a big deal to you and you don't care, I'm going to do zero trust architecture and disrupt the business. You know I mean? uh, you know, the federal okay. government's different. They can disrupt it. They're not in business. Yeah, to true. They're in business to steal it. That's different. Well, but yeah, it, what sucks about that is those those fifty five percent. Oh my gosh, it, I just I can't believe they don't see like how how well, many. But, how but many, look at it. Why why would they? Who holds them accountable? I mean, yes, from that standpoint, but. Have you, I, until they've been through it and have seen what that business impact is, like we have the well, one. Take, take Equifax, for instance. Yeah. Well, their, but their stock you, went right back up and now they're making more money than they've ever made before. And not just that, but now they've got a flourishing cybersecurity business. Are they, but are these other companies that big? That's the problem, right? If you're big enough, you can weather the storm. You know, well, it depends not, on the brick depends on the breach too right if it's if it's ransomware yeah well think about the one that we had earlier this year where they got completely ransomed including their backups they went to pay and the fbi said nope a terrorist organization you can't pay they had to basically start over what's the yeah. impact to that 
are, right. are they still in business? I honestly, I don't know. I haven't looked, but uh, yeah, I yeah. mean, are you going to survive it? Yeah. Well, so zero trust architecture, and there's a whole bunch more, you know, barriers to implementation, and those are covered, you know, in the summary. The thing, if you're going to start, let's say you want to start down the path of zero trust architecture, which again is a good thing. The concepts, if you want to start down the path, the very first thing you need to do, and if you're not going to take my word for it, because I've preached it forever, go read the NIST, SP 800-207. Because step one in the migration requires an organization, I'm quoting, requires an organization to have detailed knowledge of its assets, physical and virtual subjects, which is basically another asset, it's just people, right? right. Or processes that operate upon other processes that those are subjects and business processes. So what that means is you need to have an asset inventory, mm -hmm. detailed yeah. asset inventory. Start there, Take, put zero trust like out of your mind and just do an asset inventory. Yeah. And then I, map, map those assets then to business processes. I mean, I, that's yeah. step two. <laughs> I mean, I, I can't argue with you on that. I totally agree. Yeah. But I, at the same time, I mean, so at the end of the day, as much as we hate to admit it, there is, there's political reasoning behind it. And, you know, let's be honest, asset inventory isn't sexy, whereas zero trust, hey, that's the hot buzzword. So I, you know, they have to take that and you know, you know that was taken into consideration when they were writing and putting this together. I hope so. I hope so. Because the thing is with security too is security, there's no politics. It, security right. risk doesn't give two craps about whether you're right. black or white, oh. left or right, up or uh, down. You know, I mean, yeah, we've seen that for sure. So Number one, zero trust or not, asset inventory, hardware assets, software assets, not just, you know, servers, I'm talking, you know, firewalls, routers, mobile devices, laptops, workstations, on and on, every single bit of hardware that you're responsible for. And it got harder for people because it used to be we would have things within a boundary and now everything's exploded. Right. Right. So now you have to account for hardware. Let's say that that somebody at home, you might have to account for the kid's laptop, potentially, if there's any interaction between the two. That's an asset that's on, that interacts with your asset, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it got, it got more complicated, you know, as we get more convenient with things. And I'll, I'll tell you, man, in, in 30 years, I don't know how long I've been doing this. Uh, I've seen less than five asset inventories that I've been actually, you know, that I've actually been impressed with. When you talk about hardware, software, and data. Yeah, the data is the, that's the tricky part. I, I mean, I, I'll be honest, I, I had really good software and hardware, and I kind of had some idea of data, but yeah. it's so hard to do, especially when you're not starting from scratch, but you're inheriting something that's already been, you know, out there for so long, you, it's tough to, to make that change. Yeah, and I think the way, the way to start with data inventory is start with your applications. You know, they're the ones that either, that store, manipulate, and do things to your data. I would go, you know, out to the endpoint, probably last, right? You got to start with like, take your most critical application in your environment. Yeah. Where does it store its data? Where does it send its data? Where does it get its data, right? Start there and then, okay, we got a good handle on that, right? And then map those data flows yeah. and then go to your next most critical application. All that is progress, right? You're not going to get from not doing anything to like, I got an asset inventory because that's another thing we do in our industry. We like, 
we're such an instant gratification society that it's like, if I can't push a button and get that crap, I ain't doing it. It's like, well, well I was about then to you're going to get screwed. I was going to say, but Evan, that's hard work. I know, right? <laughs> I was telling, I was telling uh, John Harmon, you know, for the listeners, John Harmon's the president of FR Secure. We were down together in uh, Florida and I was telling him, it's hard to believe some days that we actually get paid for this because it's just logical. You know, it's just like, hmm, how am I going to, you know, what's, the, how am I going to secure my assets? It's like, hmm, what assets do you have? You're like, oh, yeah, good question. I, All right. I, oh my gosh, yes. And, you know, you can't, it's, it, a lot of times, I'll be honest, I hate having the camera on sometimes because you got to be like, no reaction when they say those things. Right. Because yeah. you're like, what? Right. Yeah. Um, and, it's not, it, and I mean, I want to be clear, I'm not disparaging or looking down at, the, at anyone who says that, but when you're like, hey, we're going to spend six figures on this cool solution and you go okay so what what do you have and they go i don't know what do you mean right. it, come on <laughs> or or you know one of my favorite questions to ask is when somebody tells you yeah we're gonna go get this thing and i ask why they're like well what do you mean why i'm like why yeah well because of this, that, and everything. Is that, is that what you need to be doing? Right? I mean, it's the same thing like when you talk to your kids, right? And I don't talk to them. I mean, you try to educate, right? I know yeah, this. This down. is what I know. You know this stuff. I, like, I, I'm, I'm not I can gonna, only imagine like an, a CPA talking yeah. to me about finances. That's exactly what I was about to say. I'm, I'm not going to tell a CPA or accounting how to do finance. I'm going to listen to their advice. Same yeah. thing here. Yeah, that's funny. So anyway, that's that's section three, man. Section three is going to be a pain in the butt, you know, and then pile on section four. Section four of the of the executive order is enhancing software supply chain security, which I think there's some really neat things here. Yeah. Um, you know, develop standards, tools, best practices for secure software development. We already have those. So that's good. We can maybe build on those, actually call those out as official. Um, enforce secure software development practices, the keyword being enforce. I love that. Then there's this new thing that pretty intriguing, right? Define and enforce a software bill of materials. Mm -hmm. An S bomb, which is like the ingredients that went into making your software. Where did you get these things? What are these things huh? potentially? It'd be really you, cool to see how that comes about. I was gonna say, yeah. Do you know what libraries you're pulling from and how do you vet them? And yeah, <laughs> I'm actually, section four, I really, uh, overall, I really liked. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and then calling out the IoT stuff and like yeah. there's a lot of really good things there. There totally is. Yeah, because the next thing, so the S-bomb is super cool. Mm -hmm. uh, it could all, but you know, just like anything, it's a double-edged sword, right? If I start disclosing the, all the ingredients in my software, potentially I'm exposing some of my intellectual property and potentially I'm exposing things that an attacker can use against me. But at the flip side, look at the open source. I mean, they, no, I, I think overall it's, it's a good thing, but it can be used for bad, just like the internet. Yeah, yeah. I, well, and, and it'll be interesting to see how this plays out because I know the ingredients of Coke, but I don't know the mixture, right? Good like, point. Just because I'm using these things, it doesn't, doesn't, I, I don't know how they're being used. Yeah. Yeah. yeah good I have a general idea, but yeah. there's still a lot behind the scenes. Totally. So that's in section four. There's also the definition of what critical software is. It's not defined yet, but that's one of the things that will be done in the work of, you know, behind section four. Yeah. And there's this other intriguing thing. The two most intriguing things in section four is the software bill materials and then the consumer labeling programs for IoT and software. That's oh, pretty cool. I was, I was so happy to see that. Yeah. You know, and going back with that critical software, 
uh, it'll be interesting to see how that plays with some of the existing like high value programs mm -hmm. that are already there like how do the do they just adopt some of that yeah so that'll be interesting to see but yeah the iot oh my gosh it's like thank goodness well, right, and you can you can equate that to like because I know uh, Carnegie Mellon was doing some things here, uh, so hopefully they you know there'll be some, I guess uh, some a marriage between that because think of the labels on the back of the foods that you eat or mm -hmm. the, the drinks that you drink. It'll be something sort of like that for IoT devices that you buy, software I think that you cool. buy. I mean, your smart TV now is going to have to tell you, hey, we're going to put pixels on the screen that record what you're doing or what you're watching. Right. How many people go, whoa, time out, what? Well, that, that was the second piece, you know, so I was talking to a friend of mine about this too, and, and I was like, I just hope people read it. Yeah. Read them. I mean, you know? well, I think what you'll see is once this takes effect, I mean, honestly, this is a, an area where Maybe the media is going to have some positive because this is going to get ratings. So, you know, that's going to get some coverage. And, mm -hmm. you know, we've, we've kind of railed against the 24-7 news coverage and all that stuff. But maybe we can get some positive out of it because they're going to be like, oh, my gosh, look at all this stuff that's happening that nobody knew about. Right. Yeah. So that's section four. Section four, also aggressive timelines. So you've got, you know. Oh. all these timelines are fast I mean, i'm i'm very happy i'm not responsible for having to put any of this in place <laughs> i'm happy no, to I see think, it happening I'm very happy i'm not responsible <laughs> if there's one government agency that i think is on the hook the most and is probably in a huge you know i'm talking about hiring hundreds of new people maybe maybe a thousand new people would be CISA. Oh yeah, which honestly, they have a lot of I'm, work to do in here. I'm okay with that. If we're gonna hire a bunch of new people, let's put them in. <laughs> That's a good area to put them in. Yeah. Section five is establish a cyber safety review board. Um, yeah. It's not a lot of meat to section five, but you know the review board essentially. Oh, one of the things the review board. One of the things the review board has to do once they're sort of assembled is create their own job description, basically. Yeah, it, it's, you know, from what I've seen, it's really kind of think of the, this as the NTSB for cyber, which is, yeah, a maybe. Good, I think it's gonna be a good thing because we've seen really good things out of that, out of the NTSB, you know, po you know positives from, hey, here's, Here's what happened for our, for transportation, and we need to do these things to fix it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'm hoping that that is how it plays out. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to see. Yeah, you know, we know that the you know who's on the board is uh, or what it's kind of going to be made up of is you know federal officials, people from the Department of Defense, Department of Justice, CISA, NSA, and FBI, and then. Uh, as appropriate or private sector entities uh, or pri appropriate uh, suppliers. Yeah, so kind of bring in experts based on what happened, right? Like, and, and what, I, what I hope they don't do is bring, because here's the thing with our industry, man, everybody's got a damn bias. You know what I mean? You like, you've yeah. got, like, let's, let's say you bring Microsoft in. What do you think? I mean, no matter how much you think, you know, oh, Microsoft, they just, you know, they just love the world. No, they love profit. They want yeah, money. That's going to be interesting to see how that plays out because ideally you're going to say, hey, we had a breach in this, you know, in topic A or whatever. So I'm going to bring in a specific expert in that area versus I'm going to bring in a Microsoft or a FireEye or, you know, whoever, and right. we'll see what happens. I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. Because I think you just need to be really careful about where the pay to play is in this, you know, about, you know, being really clear about what the rules of engagement are in these things, because 
it can easily be used and leveraged for their benefit, not necessarily the benefit of, you know, the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So hopefully they'll keep an eye on that. I don't, I'm not calling that out and saying that that's happened or will happen. I'm just saying we better keep our eye on it because if you leave it to just like, you know, chance, if you don't keep your eye on it, the bad things do happen, right? The bad things always sneak in on that when yeah. you're not watching. Yeah. Section six is standardize the federal government's playbook for responding to cybersecurity vulnerabilities and incidents. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Uh, yeah, I it, I think it's really it, this is a huge positive, right? Like, but like you said, I, yeah, CISA is going to have to hire a lot of people. <laughs> Right, because this yeah. is also really aggressive, and uh, you know, in everything, right? There's that's just the way security works, right? If it's used this way, it's awesome. If it's used this way, it's not awesome. You know, you know, something like a playbook where you've got all the agencies working off the same playbook. That's that's generally really, really positive. Now, where it could be less positive is if the enemy knows what your playbook is. You know, you and I played football, right? How beneficial would it be to know the offensive playbook when you're playing defense? Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. You know, and I will say, I, I'm reading an article uh, kind of following through, and it does have a link that DHS is doing a 60-day workforce sprint to hire 200 Cyber personnel by July 1, half of those will be uh, for CISA. The other half will be various DHS component agencies. So I, at least they're not just saying, hey, get all this done. They're actually putting, giving some resources to get this going, which is, it, I mean, it's encouraging to see. Well, I've, yeah, and I've heard the number, I've heard numbers, you know, from other sources too, up to, up to even 400. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's the the sixty day sprint. Like in the next two months, you got to hire two hundred people. That's a that's a lot. It doesn't sound like it, but that's a lot of people. <laughs> well, and you're gonna need. I mean, it, you're gonna get what you pay for too, right? So if you're gonna hire two hundred people, that'll be interesting. Pay them pay, pay them fifty thousand dollars a year. Well, that's the kind of person people you're gonna get. If you're gonna hire 200 people and pay them $150,000 a year, well yeah. then you'll get a different kind of person probably. So yeah, that'll be interesting to see because it doesn't state what level they're at. Because I mean, if you're just paying someone to monitor like in a, in a SOC entry level, yeah, okay, that's fine. And maybe that's what's needed. So it'll that's the unknown is, that's such a huge <laughs> range. Who knows what, what they're looking for? Yeah. I'm sure it's well, out you're, there. And you're competing with the private sector for those skills, right? So let's say that you find your 200 and you pull them all into this and the government, because all of this really only applies to federal government agencies and the people they do business with, you know, basically. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Ma Pa store, you know, down the street, uh, small to mid-sized businesses, uh, even education, K-12, you know, you're taking resources from there and you're putting them over here. And that's, I'm not saying that's bad or good. You just need to be aware of that because if you're, if you're hiring all these people, well, then other people on the streets are, may have to pay more. Yeah. Well, and, and this, is, this is that kind of age old discussion. Is it, better to have those people in the government or in the private sector if you know and if the government's down and ransom that's a that's a problem because so many people rely on those programs and those departments but what's the impact if now you have a business that is down because they couldn't hire it's yeah it's a uh, when you still have 50 state governments that you have to contend yeah. with and God knows how many, uh, you know, county governments and how many city governments and, you know, it's, it's not as simple as just, you know, as this. 
and, I, and I'm not saying good or bad. I, you know, I don't know enough to judge, but I do know enough that supply and demand, this is the way it works, right? If you only have so much supply and you have a huge demand over here, well, that drives prices up. And that also, you know, means less people have. Yeah. Well, I think, you know what I would, and I don't, I don't remember seeing it. I would have loved to have seen something really focusing on getting more people into the, into the industry. Yeah. There's no mention of that anywhere in this. Something around some sort of incentive for, you know, getting, you know, if you get your degree or you go into this, here's some benefit. Right. Well, that's what most of this executive order is. It's not very strategic. It's very tactical. And I think what the government needs is an overall solid strategy. Long-term, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna get out in front of these things? Because we do have a supply demand issue that would have to be part of an overall strategy. Yeah, well, I, and I think kind of reading between the lines a little bit, it doesn't call it out, but I mean, it really does give CISA that uh, imperative to like get that stuff together. Well, you, it's almost like this though. It's like, let's say that I, you know, I give you a laundry list of things that you need to do. Like here, you know, you've got now got whatever your job is today, we're going to triple the tasks that need to get done. Now, you may assume that I'm going to give you the resources to get, you know, to hire more people and to get those things done. However, I never promised. You know, I mean, there's kind of that level of like, yeah, you got to do all these things. But yeah, it's going to be, it's going to, it's not going to be easy. Yeah. So section seven is, you know, uh, improving action of, Wait, did I do six? Yeah, six was the playbook. Seven is improving detection of cybersecurity vulnerabilities and incidents on government networks. In general, not, you know, this section is not all that surprising. There's two things I think that were a little concerning for me. One is it, this particular section gives CISA the ability to do threat hunting, hunt, threat hunting on all the federal agency networks and systems without their authorization. So you'll have this blanket authorization, but essentially ceases all in your stuff anytime they want to without you knowing. And knowing that you're, you're out there hiring 400 new CISA people, it's like, oh boy, you know, you got a whole bunch of people that are new to this, maybe not new to security, but new to this game that are I, now going to be. It'll be, yeah, this is another one that is like, Oh, I think you froze, or did I freeze? Did you freeze? Was that you that time? What What's going on? My computer is like, whoa. Okay, my I guess my uh, dock is messed up. You're under attack. Oh, right. Uh, she says threat hunting that, you right now. That was bizarre. Uh, every my two external monitors just turned like reset, and everything went to the. My laptop. Anyway, uh, shoot, what was I saying? Uh, it, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Like, in again, in theory, I like having somebody responsible for looking for this stuff. What does that actually mean? We'll see. You know, are yeah. they going to subcontract that out? Is that allowed? Or you know, and that at that point, what does that look like? Or does it have to be done in house? Personally, I'd rather see it done, kept in the government, not subcontracted, because then you get a lot more, uh, again, of that bias and pay to play. But we'll see what happens. Well, and the, the flip side of this, I mean, then that, that's why, it, you know, a lot of these things have to be really thought out. But, you know, there's such aggressive timelines. I don't think you have a lot of time to really think it out because you now have this mandate where CISA is going to be doing the threat hunting and all these government agency networks. And these aren't small government agencies. They're not like some small ma pa shop. We're talking like Department of Health and Human Services, right? Yeah. Oh, thousands yeah. of employees, thousands of nodes that you need to do threat hunting. Now, if you've ever done, and you and I, I'm not saying, so when I say if you've ever done, I'm saying generically, 
you've never done threat hunting, it's not trivial. You don't oh. just click a few buttons. You know what I mean? It's time oh, it, consuming. It is. Yeah. It's in what, yeah. I, I don't know how to explain it. It's, I mean, even with the best tools, you're still kind of like needle in a haystack with only maybe a 75% of the haystack versus a hundred percent. Cause you, right. you're, there's so much noise out there that you have to weed through to determine. I mean, yeah, we see it now with the encrypted or encoded PowerShell running in memory. Well, okay, that sounds like it's an easy thing to look for. It is. How, do you know how many other software, legitimate software use encoded PowerShell? Oh, wow. right. Yeah. And so it's like, okay, got to figure out with this, is this legit? No. Yes. No. Yeah. Okay. You know, and just trying to figure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's a lot. I mean, it's, it is. And so you've got CISA test with doing that. And again, lots of new people going to be introduced into CISA, which means some of these people, I mean, play the, play the rule of numbers. Some of these people are not going to be good actors, period. It's well, just the way it is. You take a large enough population of people. Yeah. One of them is going to have some motivator to do something that they shouldn't do, whether it be they found they, they they fell on financial hard times. They uh, depression, um, a, an addiction of some sort. Shit happens. Yeah. Well, and, and, I mean, even if you let's take the rosy, you know, put on uh, the rose colored glasses or whatever. Even if there's no negative or you know malicious intent, there's going to be likely somebody who just is not good at the job and messes up <laughs> you know there's some level of incompetence that that unfortunately you see yeah. so what what happens when you've hired all these people and and you make w one bad hire out of 400 well i could definitely you know, they miss something or they do something wrong that could be pretty impactful and good and hopefully those things will all be accounted for at some level, but it's a lot of work for CISA. And then there's also, you know, a call out in section seven about, you know, the adoption of, of government wide and government wide endpoint detection and response, which, okay, you know, I'm not anti endpoint detection and response, but what specific need are you, I, what I'd rather see is rather than calling out specific products or specific technologies, call it specific things that you're trying to protect against because mm. there may be other ways to protect against things. Yeah. So yeah, obviously your EDR suppliers, you're, you know, they're going to be fighting all over this contract or these contracts and they're grinning ear to ear. Well, but just I mean, like any other tool you put, any other tool you put into an environment, if you don't run this crap correctly, you made more risk than you had before you, but started my, uh, kind of going against that what agencies where is there not edr already in place because that's a little disturbing right i would think that for the most part <clears throat> this is just formalizing that requirement of what's already in place i would hope well yeah well that, dude there's there's there are things in this uh executive order where i was like um Okay, like take uh, the government's playbook for responding to vulnerabilities and incidents. I was like, you didn't have that? I think they have it. It's just so scattered. It's, there's no central, right? Everybody has their own. Well, then you don't, it's chaos. Yeah, well, then you don't have it. Well, but each individual agency has one, but there's no, like, nobody knows what the other person is doing. We saw that with solar winds, right? You know, IRS didn't get hit because... They didn't have it was there was no internet access for the server whereas the others were like there's no i think a lot yeah, of going back to your going back to your point about not having edr it's the same thing with like a, why wouldn't you have a government playbook for all of your agencies to follow i mean it's not oh, like you're not integrated yeah, again it comes back to politics right everybody wants to be on their own and i think a lot of it is consolidating this and it's kind of tasking CISO with being like hey you're, you're responsible for all the agencies. They're not on their own anymore. You've got to have 
one, you know, one place to go. And that's what we talk about just for businesses too. Do you know who you, what's your, your IR team? Do you know who to go to, to contact this? Do these people know their responsibilities right now? Kind of seems like as a whole, no, that's not the case for the government. Now, maybe within each agency, it's well-defined. I don't know, but that doesn't help when, you know, IRS can't tell DHS something because they've got a contract. Well, we're, well, we're arguing the same thing. Yeah, I know. Just, it's all, it drives me crazy. <laughs> yeah, totally, man. So yeah, so that's section seven, more work for CISA, threat hunting on everything and EDR. Section eight is uh, improving the federal government's investigative and remediation capabilities. So this is about the types of logs that need to be retained, the time periods for log retention, it's just standardized. So much of this is just standardizing the basics, which I love. I, I love that it's calling it out and forcing them to do it. Right. It's disturbing that it, it hasn't been the case, but, you know, hey, let's get this going. Yep. Yep. And again, more CISA work to be done there. So as well as other agencies, right? It's not just CISA all throughout this. There's, you know, Oh yeah. Uh, OMB is in here. Uh, yeah. Uh, Justice Department's in here. Department of Defense is in here. There's a lot of work for a lot of people to do. So that's section eight. Section nine is, uh, you know, mention uh, national security systems. Essentially, it's you need to, the Secretary of Defense, who's responsible for those systems, uh, needs to adopt um, basically the same requirements or more. Yeah. Scott, I hope isn't a problem. No, I yeah, I kind of read this as like, hey, we gotta cover this just to make sure, but it, you you better already be doing this. Yep. Yep. And then nine, uh, that's nine. Ten is definitions. Eleven is general provisions, and then uh, yeah. that's it. So lots of lots to unpack there, and a ton of work. I'm glad I don't work in the federal government because. I don't want to be responsible for any of this. I would have been, I'd be pulling my hair out. Like, yeah. why the hell are, why the hell weren't we doing this already? I, uh, I, you know, overall, I think, I think this is going to be a positive, right? It picks off some of that low hanging fruit that we preach about multi-factor encryption. Um, I, I think it's going to push CISA. I, surprisingly, I think CISA has been kind of low key Right, a lot of people don't necessarily know what they're doing, and I think this is going to really push them out into the spotlight, which is, I think, a good thing. Yeah. Uh, but you know, if if nothing else, maybe this, yeah, uh, yeah, I think it's going to hope. I'm hoping that this is going to be a, a net positive. It could be. There's a lot of good things in there there's a lot of things that are like mm, okay we'll have to see how this goes yeah yeah well that's yeah i mean it could be good it could be disastrous it could be somewhere in between i, I you know honestly i don't know it's going to come think, down to the implementation i think yeah i, I think when, is that, there's a lot of pie in the sky kind of thinking here but well i think what we'll, we'll see in that 60 90 day window when they start publishing plans that's when we'll see and know more. I think, like I said, overall, I think it's really a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Now, we'll see if they, you know, if it's yeah. two steps forward, one step back type of thing when those yeah. plans get published. But I, again, this is a huge issue that's been neglected for a, way too long. So at least we're, we're seeing something being done which is good. Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, news, I only have one news thing and it's from Krebs and it's, uh, I think it's sort of funny because it drew a lot of attention on Twitter and other places. This was, the title is, try this one weird tr trick, <laughs> try this one weird trick Russian hackers hate, <laughs> which I think is, okay. Really what it's about is changing uh, or adding the Russian language set to your operating system. Yeah, because- the virtual keyboard, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because 
you know, Russians, they operate with impunity in Russia. Attack, as long as you don't attack Russia, attackers in Russia don't have to worry about the police coming, right? It's when attackers attack Russia that the Russians, you know, mm -hmm. kill you probably. So, you know, one of the fail safes they put in their malware is that if this is, an, if this is a system that we suspect is Russian, we will not attack it. So it's the, the keyboard is the Cyrillic keyboard. Yeah. If that's installed, well, okay, but fine. That's probably true, but now it's probably not. So, you know, don't expect this to be your fix. It's not worth my time and effort to do it. I just don't click on things and I keep things locked down. That's probably a better approach but if you want to you can install any one of what 16 17 different yeah yeah it'll be it'll be interesting to see i mean we we know russia's like you said their legal system is basically like don't do it to us and you're fine do it to us and <laughs> well enjoy the gulag in siberia right forever right you yeah. will disappear yeah so but you know there are certainly other programmatic ways for a software to determine whether this is a russian system versus a u.s system right so there's a limited window and it's a limited number of attacks that it's actually going to protect you against so it's just not for me it's not worth the effort i'm not all that concerned about russian malware because my system and I don't use it for things that put it at risk for Russian yeah. malware. I will say in there, there's that uh, batch script that adds it. So if you really wanted to it, look in that article, there's a, it's on GitHub. You can just click it and run and get it done with. But mm. still not worth my time. And I don't trust somebody's batch script. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, that's it. That's all I got for this. Uh, this is a good episode, man. A lot of stuff to talk about and unpack. And I liked, uh, I liked how you had different, and some, you know, I like your perspective because it's not the same perspective as mine. It's not that one perspective is right and wrong. It's different perspectives, and that's what makes us better. So I appreciate that, man. Yeah. Oh, and you know, like you said, at the end of the day, we're on the same page, right? We have the same goal. It's just yep. how we approach it, which is what makes this so good. And from a company perspective, not just the podcast, but but so awesome. <laughs> yeah, man, I feel the same way. Uh, any shout outs this week for you? You know, I'm going to give a shout out to my wife. She uh, volunteered to give um, the vaccine to middle school yesterday. So she spent, I don't know, four or five hours at the middle school. Uh, reconstituting and getting it ready she didn't actually do the injections but you know as a nurse it's kind of cool to see this i think she said they had they estimated 750 kids got it uh at the one middle school and they think about 750 at the other middle school will get it uh in the county so awesome, awesome. to see that that is awesome uh i'm gonna give a shout out to the daily uh the Daily Insanity check-in, folks. We're still going strong. It's now May wow. 18th. We started that, you know, the, that group in Is that March. April? Was it March or late March or April, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, when the pandemic came about, we started this uh, this group, and it's just a, it's just, it's just kind of a support group, man. It's just people talking, awesome. whatever, they, whatever's top of mind, and whatever kind of support you need. And, Need to start Whatever. trying to make it back on there. I've, been, I've had so many meetings; it's it sucks. No, whenever you get a chance, man. I think everybody there will be. Uh, it's cool. It's been cool to see how it. You know, people come, people go, people come back, people go again. You know, it's. Uh, I've made some good friends in there. You know, good yeah. people. Yeah, there was a lot of. Yeah, exactly, good people. Yeah, so I'm gonna give a shout out to those guys. Um, yeah, that's it. So thank you to all our listeners. Huge thank you uh, for to you, man, for sharing your perspectives and 
uh, you know, talking through all this stuff. If you have something you'd like us to know or you want to interact with us, feel free to email the show at unsecurity at protonmail.com. Uh, if you're the social type, socialize with us on Twitter. I'm at Evan Francine. Brad's at Brad Nye. Uh, the other Twitter, ha Twitter handles, if you're interested, you know, the places we work, uh, at Studio Security and at FR Secure. And that's it. We'll talk to you again next week.